Shay Rhodes has been to a lush tropical island in the west of the country to learn more about one of the Philippines' most striking cultures. I'm here in Palawan, which is one of the islands that Filipinas are most proud of. And it's understandable, really. It's got beautiful beaches, pristine coves, some of the most stunning natural wonders in the world. But I'm going to meet an ancient culture a group of people who are torn between honouring their traditional way of life and the pressures of living on an island that's fast becoming an eco-tourist paradise. It's early morning and I'm just off the coast of Palawan Island. I'm following a boat which is full of bajau. They're sea gypsies and they live and work in the seas around this area. They're taking us far out to one of their favourite fishing spots. And as you can see, fishing for these people really is a family business. For centuries, the bajau have lived like this. Their colourful boats cutting through the seas around the islands of the Philippines as they fish for what they need to eat and maybe a little to sell. The whole family is completely at home on the ocean. It's a romantic scene. And their name, the Sea Gypsies, conjures up alluring images of freedom and simplicity. But the Bajau are a very old culture, facing some very modern challenges. The Bajau have a settlement on the edge of Palawan's capital, Puerto Princesa. Nasuria? Yes, you can Don't go. people fall in all the time? Nasuria grew up here and she's a school teacher. It's because really? it's there the traditional way. So children learn to walk? Yeah. On these, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't yet. Yeah. So. They prefer to live under the water than the, uh, than the land. They urinate in the water and everything they, do, they will do it from the water. They wash, they, yeah. That's why they cannot live in the land. How do they make their houses? Where do, where do they get all these the different materials? They, some of the, the materials they buy from the, from the market and some of them they are just picked from the, just like deer. When they see this, it's still enough for them to, to make a house, they just pick and put two picks in their house. For centuries, the Bajau roamed the ocean south of here. But ten years ago, war and piracy forced them to settle in Puerto Princesa. But even here, they live a precarious existence. This last shack standing shows how fragile the Bajau culture is. But it's not just the weather that threatens them. The local council are advertising Palawan as a clean, eco-friendly tourist destination. They want to move the Bajau out and build a pretty promenade here. And it's easy to see why. All this plastic, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't degrade, it's just going to stay. This yeah, is, this that's is the reason why the city want all the, the, the people here want to remove from this place. They put in the other place so that this one will be a tourism area for them to make a beautiful city. And in a city where they're attempting to promote sustainability and eco-tourism, yeah. you can see why. Yeah. Traditionally, the Bajau would throw their natural materials like wood and reeds into the sea under their feet. But do that with plastic and you end up with an unhygienic eyesore. That's why the city wants to move them to concrete housing inland. But can a sea gypsy live on the land? I caught up with the family who took me fishing to ask them if they could change their way of life. When you're on the water, can you tell me how, how does it feel for you? Do you feel connected with the sea? We're much happier living on the sea than living on the land. It's better to stay here rather than go to the land. 
the world around you cha is changing a lot. Do you think your children and your grandchildren will be able to continue the same way of life? Our children and grandchildren can survive in this life. Even with the storm and this crisis and everything, we're positive that they will survive. I feel like the timing of my visit has been really quite revealing. Just a few days before I arrived here, a typhoon swept through this community and destroyed half of it. And it seems to me that, in many ways, the expectations of modernity, the expectations of the Palawenos who live with them, and the tourists who come to this island are at risk of doing exactly the same and sweeping away this ancient culture. From Palawan, we travelled south and east to learn more about one of the biggest issues facing the islands of the Philippines. These odd geological formations are known as the Chocolate Hills of Bohol. So called because when the vegetation turns brown, they look like little chocolate puddings. The Philippines has an extraordinary abundance of natural beauty. But there's a problem. This country has the highest density of unique and endangered species of any country in the world. And the rate of forest loss here has been faster and more severe than anywhere else on the planet. So the result is an environmental catastrophe, not just for the Philippines, but for all of us. This deforestation is a threat to many species of all shapes and sizes across the Philippines and here in Bohol. Among the animals that's threatened by deforestation and habitat loss here in the Philippines is the poster boy or girl of wildlife in this country, the mysterious Tarsia. And I've come here to try and find some. Lito Pizarres runs a sanctuary for these elusive creatures, nocturnal primates that are solitary, silent bug eaters, whose eyes are bigger than their brain. Oh, okay. oh. You spotted one? Yes. Oh, wow! Very small little thing. Ball of fur clinging to a branch. This is uh, like a bat, and the tail is like a rat. <laughs> Tell us how you started getting involved with Tarsiers. Uh, when I was a young boy, I always go with my father hunting. And then, uh, because my father is a taxidermist. Your dad used to stuff Tarsiers? Uh, yes. Extraordinary. During the time. And during the time, there are a lot of Tarsiers around in this area. And then something changed, I guess? Yes, because of the destruction of the habitat. Uh, the slash and burn farming. Sometimes when they burn, the, the, the hills, sometimes they also burn also. They trap by fire. So they're trapped mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're burnt alive. Mm -hmm. By year it is, it's difficult to find even a single one. So that's why I decided to stop. And I told my father to stop hunting. And, and what did your father say? <laughs> first time. He get angry at me <laughs> because that's our uh, means of livelihood. It seems incredible to me that an extraordinary little creature like the tarsier could be almost pushed into extinction in this country because of deforestation. There are a few projects like this one set up to protect the tarsier, but for the original forest on which it depended, it's too late now. There's nothing that can be done to protect that. It's already gone. There's more than 7,000 islands in the Philippines. And it's always been hard for the politicians in Manila to project their power across all of them. Just to the south of here is Mindanao, the largest 
of the islands in the Philippines, and it's one the government has found particularly difficult to control.